it started off at the Pines Theater on Joy Street and Court Avenue. For 10 cents, we could get in the movie theater and had a penny left over to buy a Tootsie Roll and watch the Saturday morning westerns. Sevierville is one of the oldest settlements in Tennessee with over 200 years of rich history. Although the generations and its memories have begun to wane, some structures from this bygone era still remain. My name is John D. Waters, Jr. We are in my office here at 107 Joy Street, Sevierville, Tennessee, which happens to be the place I was born 87 years ago in this house. But uh, I've lived here in Sevierville all my life, except for some time I spent in the Navy during the Korean War, and then some time I spent in Washington, D.C. with the Appalachian Regional Commission. The Pine Theater uh, was converted by my father. It had been an automobile dealership. Uh, there, well, where it is now, at the corner of uh, Court Avenue and Joy Street. And it was a good-sized building, except it had to r raise the ceiling because the ceiling inside the movie had to be bigger than the ones they had had. So they added about five feet on it and then raised it. I remember the Pines Theater as a young boy growing up in Sevierville. There were two theaters in town. There was the Pines and the Park at that time. And children could go to the theater at that time for 25 cents on a Saturday afternoon, and I remember many times going to see uh, Roy Rogers, Gene Autry, and other cowboy-type movies at the Pines Theater. Of course, I was about 16 years old, but uh, I became very much, I was the one that really opened up and, and closed up, so to speak, and uh, we saw had a sweet shop where we sold uh, candy, and my mother actually did all the booking of the films. Uh, and he had a little bit of a different situation. He started uh, uh, on Saturday at 10 o'clock in the morning and ran until about 11 o'clock that night. That was in the day of the singing cowboys. Uh, and uh, usually Saturday was a, uh, a cowboy of Roy Rogers, Tim McCoy, Tex Ritter, some of those, whoever was uh, popular then. And then on Friday nights, we tried to not every Friday night, but on Friday nights when we can, we scheduled a country music show. Just happy to roll, a song. You know, we were kind of new in opening up a theater, and certainly a sound theater. And when my dad built the theater, it had a big curtain that came over the stage, and then there was a kind of a gold and silver curtain that just closed over the screen. And you close the screen up when you're having a down. And then we didn't have any any uh, controls, switches on the back there to open the main curtain and it had to be done from the projection booth. He's way up, you know, way up in the ceiling head. So I always had him, he had to stand and look out the window there, and when they started playing, I said, just start playing, and he'll hear it. And, and it turned out real good because it was a good way to open up. They were, they were there, and they came out, and they started playing, and the curtain was closed, and they started playing, they played for a few seconds, and then the curtain opened up. So really what was an accident turned out to be a pretty neat thing. While they had the motion pictures, they also had a good deal of live entertainment. And I remember Homer Harris and his trick horse coming to do performances there. And kids just loved him. And uh, again, we could get in for 25 cents. And often they would have a feature and live entertainment on the same day, especially for, for, for kids on Saturdays. Mostly it was a country music store. WNOX had what was called a midday merry-go-round where they had a bunch of country music stars that uh, played on there and we used them but we were able to also occasionally get somebody out of Nashville Grand Ole Opera or somebody just on tour that found out we were doing that and, and we would tour them and put them on on a Friday night and it became very popular. Uh, a lot of people came to see the country music stars of, of that day. Probably the most famous person that I ever saw there was June Carter Cash. This was before she married John, Johnny Cash, and she uh, used to perform some on the, the Cas Walker show. This was between husbands at one time in her life, and uh, she performed there at the uh, Pines Theater. Of course, the, getting the, uh, the personal appearances by the stars were, were big eyes. I well remember one of the biggest things that we ever had was we happened to be able to book Tex Ritter. 
and he of course was a singing cowboy and he turned out to be well acquainted I got well acquainted with him and he was just a great guy. By the line that he drew with the sword when the battle was nigh. We had a lot of the country music stars that came from Roy Acuff, played the Pine Theater, Chet Atkins uh, was there many, many times. Archie Campbell was uh, just out of Knoxville, and I guess he played the Pine Theater more than anybody else. He was, then he had an act called Grandpappy comedy act that he did, and there was the Carlisle Brothers, they were big. So a lot, nearly all of them, and well, sooner or later we came to the uh, Pines Theater, and some of course more than once. I was working on Kansas TV program at that time as an entertainer. So I was working with uh, Willie Brewster, Fred Smith, Red Rector, Bud Brewster, the Webster Brothers, James Carson, Little Robert, Harold Hopper, and Robert Newton. Now, the Pines were going, it was going on maybe a little bit before they took it over. Because Bud said that, that uh, he thought that Carl Butler, Carl and Pearl Butler, may have had Dolly Parton on that show before she started coming down maybe to Cass's show. And she started coming down at 11 when she's 11 years old. I talked to Bud about it, and of course he was there uh, every Saturday night, you know, unless they were playing someplace else. And, and when they started that, uh, they usually wouldn't book anything on Saturday night because of the Pines Theater. I also remember going on Saturday evenings with my grandmother, who enjoyed going to the Cas Walker uh, shows that were held there. And his entertainers were very familiar to audiences in East Tennessee because he had an early morning TV program on one of the local stations. And he would bring that same entertainment that uh, performed on his morning shows up. And people were familiar with it. And, and they really enjoyed seeing those Cas Walker performances, the, the Brewster Brothers. Uh, I remember a guy by the name of Little Robert that used to play. Well, I'm Roger Ball, and uh, I live in Nashville now. I've been a musician there since uh, I said early 70s, and uh, grew up here in Sevier, but was born here in Sevierville. But uh, was a musician here, and moved out there in '74, and I've worked uh, with uh, a lot of the different country music acts. You know, I've recorded with Ray Price and Willie Nelson, and traveled the world as a musician. But that's uh, Retired now, but uh, uh, started off pretty much here at the Pines Theater. <laughs> My dad's name is Jim Ball. He was uh, a musician in the Knoxville uh, area the, during the music scene back then. Kaz, worked for Kaz Walker for years, did the morning radio show, and uh, worked with a lot, of the, a lot of the acts back in those days. The Osborne Brothers, uh, Carl Story, uh, Don Gibson, um, and he played, uh, of course, he played here at the Pines. Yeah, Jim Ball was a good friend of mine. He's a banjo player. And I'd go up and hang out with him. And Jim was there before I was. And uh, Jim was there in probably the 55 or 56 or 54 or something like that. I remember he had an RB100 banjo. It was a little Gibson banjo with little, little dots in the neck of it, you know. He was playing fiddle one night and he was sitting backstage waiting to go on and uh, back then he wore uh, the, the brill cream in his hair, the greasy kid stuff. And he was sitting in a chair with the fiddle on his lap and, his, and the bow on his lap. Dolly Parton walked in, she was just young and this is where kind of where she got started. She walked by and picked up his fiddle bow and just drug it through his hair and then set it back down. My uh, dad didn't think anything about it, you know, so uh, he goes out on stage and gets ready to start the show off with a good fiddle tune and he goes 
they had nothing coming out of that bowl. <laughs> you know, the family just ruined. They had to go home, and he said he and my mom washed that horse hair all night long with soap and water to get that get that grease out of it, and that's where they could rosin it up again for to play. But that, that happened here at the Pines Theater. <laughs> And Dolly came to the Pine Theater. She was only about seven or eight years old. Very, I know, I remember the guitar was as big as Dolly when she was there. Now she'd been singing in churches and schools in the community, but she'd never been. And then Kaz picked up on her and had her on his stores, his shows in Knoxville, and really helped her become a star, you know, a big star. And what happened was she graduated high school and went, went immediately to Nashville and became, of course, one of the most outstanding uh, country music stars and forever. And really a nice person. <laughs> Back at the time when I was working with Kaz Walker, I started when I was about 10 years old, singing on radio and television. And the Pines Theater, they had downtown Sevierville, and uh, Kaz used to bring his show up from Knoxville on the weekends, so I was singing with that. Dollywood has made a conscious effort to uh, highlight Sevierville as it was when Dolly Parton was uh, growing up. And I recently um, wrote uh, some material that they put on panels that are now hanging in Red's Cafe, or, or Red's Diner as it's called at, uh, at Dollywood. And they have the Pines Theater because Dolly performed at the Pines and they have the uh, Red's Diner because Dolly loved to eat the hamburgers at Red's Cafe. When the, when the theater was out there, the stairway that came right down this side, and we took it off, because that's where the balcony, the little balcony part of the theater where we could sit and see a few people up there, but the main thing was just to have the projectionist booth up there, because you know, it had to be elevated. Well, this building here was, was here just like it is now. This wall was here. This, just this, this was the entrance. But of course, when you got back just a little bit behind that where that is, you, you were on an incline that you walked up, and then you started the auditorium. But this was the, there was two restrooms, and this was the sweet shop, and the, the, ticket, the ticket booth was just ready right here. You walked right up to this, of course, there's a big marquee. And then you went in, bought by the sweet shop, and then you kind of made that incline, but you got just a little bit behind that where that wall is, and then you were up, Enough so that you started back down, the incline started back down for the, for the auditorium, right. so people could see. Uh, when the, the country music people would drive up and park there and put their, bring their equipment to them out, of, out of, into a door and end up on the stage. And they also offered um, ways to um, win prizes. I, I remember distinctly that they uh, had a greasy pole. I remember the greasy pole that was in the building and on, on intermission, uh, these guys, they would put a, I think a $20 bill on top of the pole. It didn't go all the way to the ceiling, but it went really, really high. Which was just a big, long pole and with grease on it. And if you climbed to the top of the greasy pole, there was a $5 bill on it. And people would line up to climb the the greasy pole. And these guys would come in, I remember they'd wear swimsuits, just just a bathing suit, and they'd try to climb that pole and get that money. And it was it was funny to watch them because they would just get maybe get a third of the way up and here they come, you know. It was Fred Smith and, and uh, Willie Brewster. They would have shows up there and, and when they fix, when they put the greasy pole in, they were sitting in the aisles in the floor. You couldn't get them all in. They wouldn't put nothing on it for about six or seven feet or eight feet. Then they started, they used Crisco, shortening. They would start putting some up there, and some of them would get up maybe 10 or 12, 14 foot, and boy, they, everybody was cheering and everything like that. Well, then they was getting into the good stuff. And better they'd go up sometimes uh, three foot and slide back four. You know what I mean? They meant that there wasn't nobody going to climb it. By the time it got on up there with eight or ten foot of the top, son, it was solid Crisco. You know, of course, it, it's going to ruin your clothes if you try to climb it unless you bring some old clothes because you know what Crisco is. And of course, people thought that was the funny thing. And this may last 30 minutes or something like that or 35 minutes or 40 minutes just according to how many people decide they're going to try to climb it. 
Red and Fred, they run the pines quite a bit. They played there, and that's the way they done it. But Fred said they used Mr. Walker's grease, and nobody could climb theirs. He said they, at Christmas, they even had, it was a wintertime thing too, you know, they had in that old theater, and said they had bicycles sitting there, you know, you get up and get that tag, you get this bicycle, you get up and get that tag, you can get this doll, you get all this stuff. And Fred said, you know, you didn't know how Fred talked, he said, why, you know, you know, said, we had it so slick, we know nobody could get it. And after Christmas, me and Red just divided all that stuff up. <laughs> well, I, I never did do it that way, I always give it away, but to hear Fred tell it how they divided it up, and that was the old pines, that's where they worked. See, I mean, they, he said, we went to the pines, he said, Lord, we had that pole. Now, Mr. Walker told me, now this is his quote, I wasn't there, I never did play the pines, but I was riding with him in the car, and I said, Mr. Walker, who, he told me two people that clung the pole. I don't, I don't remember one of them. He said, Dolly clung it once. He said, she's a little, little tomboy like, and said she got that. He said she went down to the creek, I believe. I believe she's the one he told me, went to the creek and got sand on her clothes and it made her clink to it and said she's real little and said she went up that thing so fast. <laughs> she, she outsmarted the grease, you know, and it said that sand that got rolling in that grease. And said she went up that like a squirrel. Now that's what he told me. You know, if you ever get to talk to her, she might tell you differently. I don't know, she may say yes and she might say no. Nobody ever climbed that grease pole. They, they actually didn't have money on it. They just said they, they was $500. But they had bicycles and other things that people would donate, toasters maybe, or prizes to go along with the $500. And when they got done with it, Fred and Willie G divided up the bounty, you know, back there. Because Fred had kids, he took the bicycles home with him, and I don't know what Willie took with them, but they never was Never anybody ever climbed a greaser pole. No pies I'd expect in exchange for my soul. Pines really was short-lived. It, it, it opened in the 40s, it closed in the 50s. It wasn't around a long time. But when it opened, motion pictures was the thing, and then TV came along. Come with me, and I'll show you what every one of you can do single-handed. Here. Well, then a few short years of its opening, and uh, TV pretty much replaced uh, movies, and people just quit going. Four speaker sound. It worked real well until long about 19, and, and I'm not sure about this date, to be honest with you, but it'd be close to 55, 56 and 7, especially maybe in there. What happened, of course, was television became very big. It finally got to Knoxville and we got so we had good television here, the three, maybe the three, NBC, S, uh, CBS and NBC and ABC. But really, it really began to work on the small town theaters because those were people that uh, came home and didn't have anything to do at night and came to a movie. And that was just, you know, that's what really our crowd was. And they were staying home watching the film. And it just kind of just, it went, petered out, so to speak, you know, finally that it got so, the crowds were so small. And uh, there was another theater in town, the Park Theater, when we closed and they operated just a very short time, maybe a year after that, and they closed. Of course, small town theaters are just generally gone. By the time I was 16 years old, I had, luckily for me, I was 16 and I had my driver's license. You had to drive to Knoxville see a movie because both the park and the pines had closed in Sevierville. The attendance fell uh, once there was TV, you know, attendance fell. Uh, there was also a theater in Gatlinburg back in that same time period and it closed and then there was one that replaced it sooner than there was in Sevierville but there was a good number of years that there was no theater left in Sevier County. You still see if they like the Tennessee Theater in Knoxville, the, the, the big boys that stayed over for certain reasons. And that's coming back to the big set where, where you have to, where you have a theater that can show six, eight, and ten different movies. Of course, we could do none of that, and you had to have a totally different, all kinds of equipment, different place usually. 
different place where you had parking. So the, 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 even, the, even the big town theaters really didn't handle that well. You kind of got out of town, so to speak. I was still quite young when uh, they closed the Pines and they converted it into a roller skating rink. And the kids in my age group would go there to the Pines to, to roller skate. Of course, they had taken the stage out. So you see, we were down to a bottom floor concrete floor which was there with the automobile business because the this elevated floor was wood you know and he put another floor in there and had a skating rink it just it didn't last long but it lasted a few you know they kind of like movies they kind of went their way too come and go yeah, yeah. Theater isn't as widely recognized as some of the other landmarks in East Tennessee, but its historical significance is undeniable. And as long as it remains standing at the corner of Joy and Court, it will remain a perfect time capsule from the days of old. <laughs>